Chapter 18. Ruling a criminal enterprise requires an instinct for fear, a flair for ruthless caprice, and a talent for herding your men into that lush minion pasture between awe and envy. Running a criminal enterprise, on the other hand, is all hard work. I woke early after the night of the Red Archer, feeling that an arrow had passed through me, leaving a red emptiness inside. I was at my desk in the passport factory before nine. Three hours of detailed work with Krishna and Willow brought my counterfeit passports up to date. After a call to my contact at the Bombay Municipal Corporation, asking him to deliver copies of the permit documents for Farzad's treasure hunting family, I headed to the Kalaba Causeway for a working lunch. Most of the five, four, and three-star hotels in South Bombay were within a three-kilometer radius of the Gateway of India Monument. 90% of Bombay's tourists could be found within the same arc of the peninsula, along with 95% of the illegal passport trade and 85% of the drug trafficking. Most businesses in the South paid protection money, called hafta, meaning a week to the Sanjay Company. The company exempted the owners of seven restaurants and bars in the same area. The owners of those bars allowed touts, pimps, tourist guides, pickpockets, drug dealers and black market traders connected with the Sanjay Company to use their premises as convenient drop-off points for goods, documents and information. My passport forgery and counterfeiting unit had to monitor these seven drop-off centers for usable documents. For the most part, that job fell to, me, fell to me. To keep enemies and potential rivals guessing, I changed the order of the bars and restaurants every day, rotating between them often enough to confuse any sense of routine. I started on that day at the Trafalgar restaurant, only a good knife's throw from Lightning to Leap's desk in the Calaba police station. At the door of the corner facing restaurant, below the three st steep steps leading inside, I paused to shake hands with a memory man named Arishikesh. Memory men were a criminal subcast in those years, men who lacked the foolhardiness to risk prison time by actually committing crimes, but whose intelligence and prodigious memories allowed them to make a modest living, serving the fearless fools who did. Taking up positions in high criminal traffic areas, such as the causeway, they made it their business to know the latest figures for the day's gold prices, the current black and white market exchange rates for six major currencies, the carat price for white diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and sapphires, and half-hour fluctuations in the price of every illicit drug from cannabis to cocaine. What's up, Keish? I asked, shaking his hand. No problem, Baba, he grinned, raising his eyes to the sky for a moment. Uparwali. The word he'd used was a reference to God, and one of my favorites, more often used in the singular, Uperwala. It could be roughly translated as the person upstairs. Used in the plural, the term meant the people upstairs. Uperwale, I replied. Let's go. Okay, he said, becoming serious as he launched into his iterations of the latest prices and rates. I only needed the golden currency exchange rates, but I let Keish run through the whole of his repertoire. I liked him and admired the subtle genius that allowed him to hold hundreds of facts in his current memory, adjusting them as often as three times in a single day without a decimal point of error. Most gangsters held fringe dwellers like Cash in contempt. I never understood it. The small-scale street outlaws were harmless people surviving through cleverness and adaptive skills in a hostile environment that sometimes didn't treat them well. I also had a soft spot for independent outlaws, men and women who refused to join the ranks of law-abiding citizens no less resolutely than they rejected the violence of hardcore criminals. When his recitation ended, I paid him twice the going rate for a memory man's mantra, and he gave me a smile like sunlight streaming off the sea. Inside the restaurant, I sat with my back to a wall. I had a clear view of the street. A waiter nudged my shoulder with his belly. I ordered a vegetable sandwich and a coffee. I didn't have to signal anyone. I only had to wait. I knew that the information network of the street was already at work. One or more of the endlessly drifting street guys roaming the tourist beat would have seen me park my motorcycle, talk with Keish, and enter the restaurant. Word would already be spreading through neighboring lanes and dens. Lin Baba is sitting at Trafalgar. Before I finished my sandwich, the first contact arrived. It was Billy Basu, 
hesitating close to my table. He glanced around nervously, spoke very softly. Hello, Mr. Lin. My name is Billy Basso. I am working with Dennis, the sleeping Baba. You might be remembering me. Sit down. You're making the boss nervous. He glanced at the restaurant boss, leaning on the counter, his hand playing in the trays of change as if they were pebbles in a stream. Billy Basu sat down. A waiter appeared immediately, slapping a grimy vinyl menu booklet in front of Billy. The rules in all the drop-off bars and restaurants were simple. No fighting or disturbances that might upset the civilians, and everyone buys lunch, whether they eat it or not. I ordered tea and a takeaway sandwich parcel for Billy. When the waiter left us, Billy came to the point quickly. I have a chain, he said, reaching into his pocket. Solid gold it is, with a picture locket attached. He put the gold locket and chain on the table. I picked it up, running my thumb over the links of the chain, and then prized open the locket. I found two photographs, a young man and a young woman, facing each other and smiling happily across the hinge of their little world world that had found its way into my hand. I don't take stolen goods, Billy. What's stolen, Baba? He demanded indignantly. This was a trade, a fair trade, the locket for dough, and good quality, almost 50% pure, all square and fair. I looked at the photographs of the young couple again. They were Northern Europeans, bright-eyed and healthy, for the kind of social background that put perfect teeth in untroubled smiles. They looked about 20 years old, how much do you want? Oh, Baba, he grinned, beginning the Indian bargaining ritual. That is for you to say, not me. I'll give you five dollars American. But, he spluttered, it's much too less for such a piece. You said it was for me to say. Yes, Baba, but it is for you to say a fair price. I'll give you 60% of the grand weight price. Do you agree it's 18 carat gold? It's, it's maybe 22 carats, Baba. No, it's 18, 60% or try your luck with the Ma Ma Marawaris in Zaveri Bazaar. Oh no, Baba, he said quickly. If I deal with the Marawaris, I'll end up owing them money. They're too smart. I'd rather deal with you. No offense. None taken. Fifty percent. Done at sixty. I called the waiter, passed him the locket and chain, and told him to ask the manager to weigh it on his jewelry scale. The waiter slouched over to a desk and handed over the chain. Using a fine scale that he kept under the counter, the manager weighed the locket and chain, wrote the gram weight on a piece of paper, and handed them back to the waiter. The waiter passed the paper to me, hefted the chain and locket in the bowl, in the bowl of his hand for a moment, as if checking the accuracy of the scale, and then dropped them into my upturned palm. I glanced at the figure on the paper, and then showed it to Billy Basu. He nodded. Using Keisha's figure for the current rate, I rounded the amount to the nearest 10 rupees and wrote the figure on the same sheet of paper, showing it to Billy. He nodded again. You know, Baba, he said, as he put away the money, I saw that Naveen Adair before, that Anglo detective fellow. He gave me a message, if I see you in any place today. As it happens, I'm in any place right now. Yes, he replied earnestly, so I can give you his message. There was a pause. Would you like another sandwich parcel, Billy? Actually, yes, Lin Baba. Jamal is waiting outside. I waved for another par parcel. Are we good for the message now? Oh, yes, Numin said, let me be exactly sure. Tell Lin Baba, if you see him, that I have nothing new about the man in the suit. That's it? That's the message? Yes, Baba. It's important, no? Critical. Let me ask you something, Billy. Yes, Baba? If I didn't buy your chain, were you going to give me the message? Of course, Baba, he grinned, but for more than just two sandwiches. The sandwich parcels arrived. Billy Pasu put his hand on them. So, so now, I'll take my leave? Sure. When he left the restaurant, I looked again at the photographs of the smiling young couple. I closed the locket and dropped it into my shirt pocket. For the next four hours, I worked my way through the other six drop-off restaurants and bars in my district, spending about 40 minutes in each one. It was an average day, I bought a passport, three pieces of jewelry, 750 US dollars in cash, an assortment of other currencies, and a fine watch. That last item, in the last trade of the day, in the last of the bars, involved me in an angry dispute with two of the street guys. The man who brought the watch to me, Deepak, settled the price quickly. 
It was a price far below the actual value of the watch, but far more than he could expect to receive from the professional buyers in the fort area. At the moment of the handover, a second man, Ishtiak, entered the bar, shouting for a share of the money. Ishtiak's strategy was simple, make a big enough fuss to force a concession from Deepak before the latter had the chance to slip away in the crowded street. In other circumstances, I'd have taken my money back, shoved both men out of the bar, and forgotten about them. My long-standing relationship with the bar's owner was more important than any one transaction. But when I put the watch to my ear, I'd heard the reassuring trip-click movement, twitching toward its rundown cycle, the mechanical heart beating its rhythm, reward for the daily winding fidelity of its owner. It was, as it happened, my favorite watch. Ignoring my instincts, I tried to placate Ishtiag. The momentary weakness ignited impudence, and he shouted all the harder. Diners at other tables began to stare at us, and it wasn't a big place. Speaking quickly, I soothed Ishtiag, pulled some money from my pocket, and paid him off. He snatched at the notes, snarled at Deepak, and left the bar. Deepak gave me an apologetic shrug and slipped out onto the street. I slid the metal bracelet of the watch over my hand, to my wrist. I snapped the cat shut. It was a perfect fit. Then I looked up to see the manager and his waiters staring at me. The short story written in their eyes was clear. I lost face. Men in my position don't placate street tourists, touts like Ishtiak. I glanced again at the watch on my wrist. My greed had weakened me. Greed is human kryptonite, Carla once said to me as she pocketed all of the commission we'd just made together on a deal. I needed to work out and swung the bike through traffic, heading for the Mafia boxing gym at Ballard Pier. The manager of the gym, Hussein, was a veteran gangster who'd lost an arm to a machete blow in a battle with another gang. His long, scarred face found its way into a biblical beard that rested on the prodigious mound of his chest. He was brave, kind, funny, tough, and a match for any of the young gangsters who trained at the gym. Every time I looked into his laughing, dangerous eyes, I wondered what he and Karabai must have been like, the young fighters who created a gang that became a mafia company. Let my enemy see the tiger, they used to say, before he dies. There was no doubt that Hussein and Karabai had shown the tiger many times as they prowled the city, young and fearless, all those years before. And something of that striped menace lingered in the burnt clay eyes of the gym master. Wa wa alin baba, he said as I entered the gym. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. One Hussein. Because another Hussein joined Karabai in those early years and went on to hold a position on the council, they were sometimes known as one Hussein and two Hussein for the number of arms they possessed. Kya hal hain? How are you going? Busier than a one-armed man in a bar fight, I replied in Hindi. It was an old joke between us, but he laughed every time. How are you? One Hussein Bai. Still swinging the punches, Lin Baba. If you keep punching, you stay hard. If you stop the windmill, there's no flower. You got that right. Are you training full session, Lin? No, one Hussein Bai. Just loading the guns. Loading the guns was gangster slang for a workout that pumped the biceps and triceps in the same session of supersets. Damn good, he laughed. Keep the guns loaded, Yar. You know the two rules of combat. Make sure they know they've been hit, and make sure they stay hit, I finished for him. Jarur. He handed me a towel as I walked past into the main training room. The gym, which at first had been a small, dirty space where large, dirty gangsters learned the arts of street fighting, had proven so popular with the young men of the Sanjay Company that it had been expanded to include the whole of the neighboring warehouse. In the foreground, there was an assortment of weight training, training equipment, Benches, lot and rowing machines, incline and decline presses, squat bars, chin-up and dip bars, and stacks of heavy plates and dumbbells. Beyond that area, lined with mirrors, was the blood-stained boxing ring. Further into the newly created space was a wrestling and judo mat. Lining the far wall were heavy body bags and suspended speed balls. In the corner leading back toward the entrance was a corridor, two men wide, formed with vinyl padded walls. The corridor was the training space for knife fighting. It was hot in the gym. Grunts, moans, and shouts of pain pierced humid air that was sweating adrenaline and that high, scrape the bone smell of testosterone. I spent a large part of my life in the company of men. 
Ten years of my life in prisons, seven years in gangs, 20 years in gyms, karate schools, boxing clubs, rugby teams, motorcycle groups, and all my growing years in a boys' school, more than half of my life in exclusively male societies. And I've always felt comfortable there. It's a simple world. You only need one key to every locked heart, confidence. Nodding to the other young men in the weight training area, I took the long knife scabbards from their truck tucks in the back of my jeans and folded them with my money, keys, the watch, and my shirt on a wide wooden stool. Strapping on a thick leather weight belt, I slapped the towel on an empty bench and began my alternate sets of reclining tricep extensions and standing bicep curls. After 30 minutes, my arms were at the peak of their pump. I collected my things and made my way to the knife training corridor. In those years before every handbag thief carried a gun, the techniques of knife fighting were a serious business. The masters who taught their knife skills were cult heroes for young gangsters and treated with as much deference as members of the Sanjay Council themselves. Hatoda, the man who'd taught me for two years, had also taught Ishmit, the leader of the cycle killers, who'd passed on the skills to his own men. The knife master was just leaving the corridor with a young street fighter named Tricky as I approached. They both greeted me with smiles and warm handshakes. The young gangster, exhausted but happy, excused himself quickly and headed for the shower. A good kid, Hatoda said in Hindi, as we watched him leave, and a natural with a knife. May he never use it in shame. The last phrase was a kind of incantation that Hatoda taught his students. I repeated it instinctively, as we all did, in the plural. May we never use it in shame. Hatoda was a Sikh, from the holy city of Amritsar. As a young man, he'd fallen in with a tough crowd. Eventually, he'd abandoned his studies and spent almost all of his time with the local gang. When a violent robbery led to conflict with community leaders, Hatoda's family disowned him. As part of the price of peace, his gang had been compelled to cast him out as well. Alone and penniless, he made his way to Bombay and was recruited by Karabai. He apprenticed the young Sikh to Ganesh Bai, the last of the master knife fighters who'd started with Karabai in the early 1960s. Hatoda never left the master's side and through years of study became a master himself. He was, in fact, the last knife teacher in South Bombay, but none of us knew that then, in those years before the glamour of the gun. He was a tall man, something of a disadvantage for a knife fighter, with a thick mane of oiled hair coiled into a permanent topknot. His almond-shaped eyes the same Punjabi eyes that with a single smoldering stare had seduced travelers to India for centuries, glowed with fearlessness and honor. His name, the one that everyone in South Bombay knew him by, Hatoda, meant hammer in Hindi. So, Lin, you want to practice with me? I was just leaving, but I'm happy to stay for another session if your reflexes are up to it. I don't want to put you out, Master G, I demurred. It's no trouble, he insisted. I'll just drink water and we'll begin. I'll train with him. A voice from behind me said, speaking in Hindi, the Gora can work out with me. It was Andrew Da Silva, the young Goan member of the Sanjay Company Council. He, his use of the term Gora, meaning white man, though very common in Bombay, was insulting in the context. He knew it, of course, and leered at me, his mouth open and his lower jaw thrust out. It was also a strange thing to say. Andrew was very fair-skinned, his part Portuguese ancestry evident in his reddish-brown hair and honey-colored eyes. Because I spent so much time riding my motorcycle in the sunlight without a helmet, my face and arms were darker than his. That is, Andrew added, when I didn't respond, if the goda isn't afraid that I might embarrass him. It was the right moment on the wrong day. What level do you want? I asked, returning his stare. Level four, Andrew said, his leer widening. Four it is, I agreed. All training in the knife-fighting arts was done with hammer handles, the reason for Hatoda's enduring nickname. The wooden handles, without their hammer heads, approximated the hilt and heft of a knife and could be used for practice without causing the grievous injuries of real knives. Level one used the blunt end of a basic hammer handle. Level four training used handles shaved to points, sharp enough to draw blood. Training bouts were usually conducted in five one-minute rounds, with a 30-second recovery period between them. Stripped down to jeans and bare chests, we entered the training corridor. 
and Toda, standing in the entrance to ref referee the session, handed us one sharpened handle each. The space was tight, with only a few centimeters of movement possible to left or right. The aim was to teach men how to fight in close quarters, surrounded by enemies. The end of the padded corridor was blocked off. The way in was the only way out. Andrew held his sharpened handle in the underhand grip, as if he was holding the hilt of a sword. I held mine with the blade downward and adopted a boxer's stance. Hatoda nodded to check that we were ready, glanced at the stopwatch hanging around his neck, and gave the signal. Begin! Andrew rushed at me, trying for a surprise early strike. It was an easy sidestep. He stumbled past me, and I gave him a shove that sent him into Hatoda at the open end of the corridor. A young gangster watching from behind the master began to laugh, but the master silenced him. Andrew spun around and stepped towards me more cautiously. I closed the gap between us quickly, and we exchanged a flurry of jabs, thrusts, and counter moves. For a moment, we were locked in a tight clinch, heads knocking together. Using some main strength, I shoved Andrew off balance, and he lurched backward into the closed end of the corridor to regain his footing. Attacking again, Andrew fainted jabs, lunging at me. Each time I arched my back, pulling out of range, and slapped at his face with my free left hand. Several of the young gangsters training in the gym had gathered near the entrance to the corridor to watch. They laughed with each slap, infuriating Andrew. He was a full member of the Sanjay Company Council, and the position, if not the man, demanded respect. Shut the fuck up, Andrew screamed at the onlookers. They fell silent at once. Andrew glared at me, his teeth clenched on the hatred he felt for me. His shoulders arched around the anger pumping outward from his heart. The muscles stiffened in his arms, and he began to shiver with the strain of suppressing his rage. It hurt him not to win. He thought he was good with a knife, and I was making him realize that he wasn't. I should have let him win. It would have cost me nothing, and he was my boss, in a sense. But I couldn't do it. There's a corner of contempt we reserve for those who hate us, when we've done them no wrong those who resent us without cause and revile us without reason. Andrew was corralled into that corner of my disdain as surely as he was trapped in the dead end of the training corridor, and contempt almost always conquers caution. He lunged. I swung around, avoiding the blow, and brought my pointed handle down into his back between the shoulder blades. Three points, Hatoda called. Andrew lashed out with his handle, swinging around to face me. He was off balance again, and a sweep of my foot brought him down beside me. Landing heavily on top of him, I jabbed the hammer handle into his chest and kidneys. Six more points, I told her called out, and stop, time to rest. I stepped back from Andrew. Ignoring Hatoda's command, he stood and rushed at me, jabbing with his wooden blade. Stop, I told her shouted, rest period. Andrew pressed on, slashing at me, trying to draw blood. Against the rules of training, he was trying to stab me in the throat and the face. I parried and protected myself, stepping further into the dead end corridor. Countering with my fists and handle, I struck back at him through every opening. Within seconds, our hands and forearms were bleeding. Strikes against our chests and shoulders sent thin streams of blood down our bodies. We bounced off the padded walls and into one another, fists and handles flashing, breathing hard and fast as our feet began to slip on the stone floor until the wrestling struggle sent us both to the ground. Luckier in the fall, I closed an arm around Andrew's neck, locking him in a chokehold. His back was to my chest. As he tried to wriggle free, I wrapped my legs around his thighs, holding him immobile. He thrashed around, making a slither on the slippery stone, but my grip on his throat was solid, and he couldn't shake me off or twist himself free. Do you quit? Fuck you, he spluttered. A voice spoke from a place of ancient instinct. This is a wolf in a trap. If you let it go, sooner or later, it'll come back. Lin, a different voice said. Lin, brother, let him go. It was Abdullah. The strength drained from my arms and legs, and I let Andrew slide away from me onto his side. He gasped, choking and coughing, as Hatoda and several young gangsters crowded into the corridor to assist him. Abdullah reached out and pulled me to my feet. Breathing hard, I followed him to the rows of hooks where I'd left my things. Salam alaikum, I greeted him. Where the fuck did you come from? 
Wa alaikum salam, from heaven it seems, and just in time. Heaven? It would certainly have been hell if you had finished him then. They would have sent someone like me to kill you for it. I gathered my shirt, knives, money, and watch. In the entrance to the gym, I used a wet towel to wipe down my face, chest, and back. Strapping on the knives, I threw the shirt over my shoulders and nodded to Abdullah. Let us ride, my brother, he said softly, and clear our minds. Andrew de Silva approached me, stopping two paces away. This isn't over, he said. I stepped in close and whispered so that no one else could hear. You know what, Andy? There's a lane at the back of this gym. Let's get it over with, right now. Just nod your head and we'll get it done. No witnesses, just us. Nod your head, big mouth. I leaned back to look at his face. He didn't move or speak. I leaned in again. I didn't think so. And now we both know. So back the fuck off and leave me alone. I gathered my things and left the gym with Abdullah, knowing that it was a foolish thing to humiliate Andrew da Silva, even privately. A wolf had escaped, a wolf that would probably return when the moon was bad enough.